Ooh, welcome, Mike. I'm Nicholas. I'm Alex. My name is Noah. Where can they find your work? <laughs> you can find my work at noahmoreparties.com. Hell yeah. Uh, follow them, Twitters, all that stuff down below in the description. Today, we're going to go round by round up until round 10 and pick dudes that basically our favorite players in that round. We'll, we'll call it the must draft because that just absolutely pops on YouTube SEO. The must draft players <laughs> will avoid round one because I feel like that's too easy, too obvious. Everyone wants every single player in round one. So we all want those guys. So what we did was we looked at uh, four for four has a section on their website where they take all the ADPs from different websites, multi-site ADPs and kind of like average them out. I did exclude, I, I think we're using ESPN, FFPC, best ball tens and underdog. So it's a mix of like casual leagues, but also paid leagues, some best ball, whatever. So I think it gives you a good mix of like what real drafts might look like, you know, uh, amongst your friends, college buddies, maybe a little bit more serious. Cause I think if you take like underdog ADP, it's like way too serious. Your, yeah. your home friends are never drafting that way. But if you're using like ESPN, you're getting like fucking, you know, Jamar chase at the end of the second round, also not reasonable. So we took the average of it and we're going to go basically round by round Starting off with Alex in round two, I'll take round three, picking our favorite players and just kind of, you know, going conversationally through each pick um, and just kind of telling Alex why Jalen Waddle is just such a bad pick in the second round. <laughs> so um, welcome. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoy the video. Alex, why don't you start us off round two? Yeah, I think round two has to be Jalen Waddle. Like you said, probably the best pick that you can make in the second round at this point. I mean, one of the things that people overlook is a lot of people see on paper, okay, he was the wide receiver five, but I think people forget that Tyreek Hill just had his career high in receptions and in receiving yards by a lot. And Jalen Waddle still finished as a top five wide receiver. All the underlying metrics said it. He was fourth in yards per route run. He was top 10 in route run win rate. But he also took a massive jump from year one to year two. He took it over 350 receiving yard leap. I don't get why that's not going to continue to grow, especially in the second year of this Mike McDaniel offense. Tua should be a year better. Tyreek Hill is only going to get a year older coming off career highs. I think all signs are pointing up for someone like Jalen Waldo, who just led the NFL in yards per reception and could score a touchdown legitimately every single catch that he has this year. Where is he going right now? What's his ADP? I think his ADP is the 210. So he's going in the late, late, late second round. So I'd take him over someone like an Amon Ross St. Brown that's going a little bit higher in the second round right now. I agree. I think Waddle's upside is kind of like crazy and I think two is going to kind of come into his own a little bit there's like a big discrepancy between Tyreek and, and Waddle in terms of targets I think he had like 50 or 60 more targets than him but if you look at every metric Waddle was as if not more efficient than he was he led the league I think in like yards per reception yards per target yeah. Tua shockingly led all NFL quarterbacks in touchdowns of 40 and 50 plus yards and he wow. missed like four or five games do you think we used that stat in like trivia the other day you would think that you know, if I ask you, you know, who, what quarterback led the league, you'd say Mahomes, Mahomes, Allen, whatever. Who has the biggest fucking arm? It's Tua. It's because he's got guys like Waddle and Hill. He's not afraid to take those shots down the field. They also turn slants and screens into 60-yard plays. Waddle's awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm all in on Waddle as well. I think both of them can have top five, top six seasons because – the passing, like, who else is catching balls in that offense? Yep, especially with Mike Mike Gusecki, he's gone. Not like he had a great year last year, but he was, like, their pass-catching tight end that was supposed to be the third guy for them. I mean, he's not on the team anymore. They don't really have anybody else. So I think that it would not shock me this year if we see Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle each have a 30% target share. I agree. Like, I don't think there's ever been a team to ever to do it, but I think this is the team that's perfectly set up to do it. But not only the 40 and 50 yards, but I think people also forget about the fact that Tua actually led the NFL – in yards per attempt by a wide margin. And he also led the NFL in fantasy points scored versus man coverage per snap. Interesting. Like on a per snap basis, he was like the best fantasy quarterback in the entire NFL. I think part two is probably just underrated as a quarterback a little bit. Agreed. I think we think of him as like a dink and dump because he came in a little bit unhealthy, the hip injury, and like we haven't really seen him get to explode. And the Mike McDaniel offense is not like a run heavy offense. Like they use their running backs, but in terms of percentages and stuff like that, like they bring in a chain, but I mean, none of us are like, Oh, Wilson, most are a chain are, are like passing down running backs of consequence, you know? So I, I think it's, I think Waddle had like a 21 and a half percent target share or something like that last year. So if him and Tyreek Hill split the difference and he stays that efficient, why I actually think both of them can be like top five fantasy wide receivers again. And he's going like 10, 11. First ever one, two wide receivers. Did you also see the, the two cam? At, at their mini camp, no. I've never seen this with a quarterback before. But Mike McDaniel put an eye camera onto his helmet, so it's like a little see, GoPro like attached, so he can look exactly that's where sick. he's looking and help him even more. I've never seen it, but it's like a little USB that's literally on the side of his helmet, 
that they use to be able to track kind of where his eyes are looking throughout practice. I'd be so exposed. I feel like I'd be yeah. just looking at the weird. You just see me looking at like fucking Raheem Mostert's asshole all the time. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm all in on Waddle. I think he's probably the best like bang for your buck as a, a wide receiver in the second round. I think it opens you up to grabbing a running back early, whereas most people are going with wide receivers in the first round. You know, you get your chase and Jefferson. Obviously, you don't want to fade them, but if you get to like the eight nine rather than taking like a Stefan Diggs or something like that, you can take the the Saquon or the Eckler and then pair him with Jalen Waddle, who second wide receiver on his team, but going to be a wide receiver one in fantasy this year. So I love him. Third round, Ramondre Stevenson's dropping into the third round. I don't know how long this is going to last for, but even on underdog and like sharper drafts, he's going three, five, three, six. And I think what people don't realize is just how crazily involved he was in the passing game last year. If you look at most statistics, most metrics, it was like C-Mac, Eckler, Ramondre Stevenson. He had like upwards of 80 targets. And I was listening to the video you put out the other day where you were like, um, you know, which guys hit the threshold of really being league winning yeah. running backs. And I agreed with your take. I was like, Ramondre is like 70 to 75% there. Mm -hmm. I just, it was like a, it was like a vibe thing, which is like, I don't think he'll really get there. There's no way he's getting to hundred targets, but he no. could be, he's just so involved and they very clearly felt comfortable letting him run the workhorse role there. Had they re-signed uh, Damian Harris, maybe I'd say, like, listen, they really want to use a committee here. I don't know if I trust Ramondre long-term, like more than two years or something like that. But for this year, it feels like a perfect storm of where he's at in his career, what they need out of the backfield, what he can offer them. Pierre Strong's like a Raheem Mostert where he's like an, he can be an explosive guy for your offense. Kevin Harris didn't really do anything last year for them. So there's no actual competition there from any backs that are proven. So Ramondre feels like an absolute smash in the third round where it's an offense that's going to have to lean on their running backs. They've always, you know, naturally had a pretty good offensive line. So I think that will end up being the case. And he's a guy who we've already seen Bill give, you know, that's the problem. It's like, yeah, they use a committee there. You never see guys like Damian Harris get into like the 2025 20, touch range. You've already seen Ramondre like operate as a workhorse. Wouldn't be surprised if, that's just the way that they kind of run Stevenson the rest well, of the year. Well, especially people made it out to be like it was just from Andre last year, but Damian Harris played 11 games and he averaged 12 touches a game. Where are those 12 touches a game going to go? Yeah. Kevin Harris, Ty Montgomery. I mean, they'll split them up between those yeah, guys, so. but even if they do, like Ramondre was still land at, you know, yeah, 17, he's get 18. an extra two, three, probably a game. Yeah. And a lot of that is passing work. Like he, yeah. he, I just, you can't understate just how heavily involved he was in the passing game. And again, a lot of that comes from the lack of weapons. Like the, it's not like the Patriots added anything of real consequence to their to their game like maybe if they drafted JSN in the first round and then went back and drafted like a Cedric Tillman in the third round you start to say hey maybe the targets are dispersed a little bit they didn't do that at all so I I have a lot of confidence that Ramondre is going to be a four to five target a game guy like ASAP so he's he's a dude again if you go wide receiver if you double tap if you go Diggs Waddle and then at the you know three six or something like that Stevenson is sitting there beautiful start yeah I think I think one of the other things about Ramondre real quick that that, that gets overlooked is that you talked about the like we see the the stats where it's Christian McCaffrey and then Eckler and then Ramondre. Like the biggest one for me is the targets per route run. Like when they're commanding targets when they're on the field, there were only three running backs in the NFL last year that had over a twenty five percent target per route run. It was Jeez. Eckler, CMC, and Ramondre Stevenson was targeted. I think twenty seven percent of the time when that's he was wild. on the field. Like that's crazy. It's one in four, and they're looking for. So what happens when you have no other fucking. Yeah. It, it's like with Justin Herbert, his like average depth of target was so low. That's what I, if Mike Williams and Keenan Allen are hurt, your next best pass catching weapon is your running back. Of course, like your all your throws are going to be a yard from the line of scrimmage. A lot of that happened with like Mac Jones and Ramondre Stevenson. So I just don't see a world where he is not a fantastic running back this year in fantasy. You know, yeah, he just feels super safe. Yeah, the, the floor is so high. I, the ceiling, I, and I think the ceiling is really high too. The likelihood of him hitting the ceiling a little bit more risky, just the fact that he's in the Patriots offense. But overall, I can't imagine him going for fewer than like. You know, 1,300, 1,400 yards from scrimmage, 8 to 10 touchdowns. And he also, like, had only six touchdowns last year. Like, his, his expected touchdowns were so much higher than he actually had. Like, I think he was sixth in the NFL in carries inside the five, but he only had three rushing touchdowns. He had really? three rushing and three receiving. I wonder how, do you know how many Damian Harris had? Uh, goal I, line? I don't know, but I know that Ramondre Stevenson, I believe, had 19 goal line carries last year, and he only scored three touchdowns. Wow, that's kind of crazy. So, like, he is bound. I mean, it's not like Ramondre Stevenson is, like, a super tiny back. I mean, he's, like, two, but, he's like six foot 225. Yeah, would anyone be surprised if he had 13, 12? 13 rushing touchdowns this year you know Not what I mean all. even if the Patriots are fucking eight and eight nine and eight or sure eight and nine or something but if you didn't if you didn't know that stat and I said to you hey Ramondre Stevenson will lead the NFL in rushing touchdowns like that's not a ridiculous thing because everyone thinks of him as just this big back behind yeah. a big offensive line. The Patriots aren't going to be throwing inside the five yard line. Yeah, yeah. All in. You can have 12, 15. All in on Mondi, baby. Let's get it. All right. In the fourth round, 
Joe Mixon is going at the 409. He was the RB6 last year in PPR points per game. Currently drafted as the RB17. Like, the obvious risk with whatever his, like, disciplinary legal situation is, but he's going to get more expensive as news continues to, like, not come out about that legal situation. And if it resolves itself with, like, no discipline, he's obviously going to go way higher. And, like, he wasn't... He wasn't that good last year. Like, he got hurt. He was super inconsistent. He was inefficient. But I don't think he's, like, washed. Like, his rushing yards over expected per attempt was right there with guys like Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, Saquon Barkley. Like, we don't think those guys are washed. Joe Mixon's doing the same shit on a per-carry basis that they are behind an offensive line that got worse last year. Like, their PFF grade dropped significantly. Now they added Orlando Brown. Like, that might help offset some of that lost efficiency. They also lost Samaj P. Ryan. And, like, they drafted Chase Brown. Travion Williams is on the team, but we don't know, like, if those dudes can actually play in the NFL. We don't know if they can cut into his workload as much as Samaj P. Ryan did. Like, we might get to late August, and Samaj P. Ryan is just a bell cow running back on one of the best offenses in the league who was being drafted as, like, a low-end RB2 over the summer. And you mean just, Mixon? You're, what? Mixon? Yeah, you Mixon. You Ryan. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mixon. And you, you might just get a top-five running back for... Low end RB two prices right now. Where do you think he settles in drafts? Because he's like RB at the beginning of the spring, he was like the RB forty because everyone was like yeah. they're going to cut him, whatever. And now he's at RB seventeen, eighteen. Do you do you? I feel like most people because I put out a video like my top twelve running back rankings, and I think I slotted Mixon in as the twelve. And a lot of the comments were like, I just can't draft Mixon as an RB one. I feel like he'll settle as like the RB fourteen ish. I mean, if there's no disciplinary anything for him, and he's just playing like easy RB one for me, like RB. Eight RB nine yeah. yeah. probably. Okay, I, I agree with that. One of my ho- one of my big hot takes from my last episode is that he he finishes top three this year. They can give they really can, like, well because well I think one of the things that people overlook is the fact that like he was supposed to be cut, he was supposed to be cut, he was supposed to be cut, but then they could have paid Samaj P Ryan like four million a year and signed it, but no, they didn't. They kept yeah. Joe Mixon, and Joe Mixon's dead cap hit if they cut him after next year is like nothing. So I think it, this could be like a similar a la twenty two. Josh Jacobs. Jacobs, where it was the same thing for him. They didn't think that they were going to be able to pay him, so they just ran him into the ground. Why wouldn't they do that with Mixon? I mean, P. Ryan was averaging, similar to Damian Harris, about 10 touches a game. That 10 touches a game is not going to go to Travion Williams or yeah. go to Chase Brown. And on top of that, Mixon just came off career highs in receptions and targets in a season. I wouldn't be surprised to see him get even more passing down work. And, like, I just don't see how, if he stays healthy, he doesn't end up with another, like, 300-plus touches, especially when he's been in the top 15 for the last five years. And yeah. P. Ryan was, like, a 50-target guy, too. Like, he was cutting into that significantly. Joe Mixon was still productive in the passing game. Those thresholds that I was talking about in that video are, like, 300 carries, I think 100 targets, 17 touchdowns. Like, this is an offense good enough to get Mixon 17 touchdowns. Yeah. He's, he almost had it. What do you have, 13 or 14 a couple of years ago? Yeah, just, yeah. Just rushing? And he flirts with 300 rushing like he has before mm-hmm. on this same offense. If he can stay healthy, he can do that, or at least pace for it in the games that he's playing. I, th- I think the uh, with Mixon, this this is like a situation where it's like you, you almost need to just like take your head out of the numbers and realize Cincinnati just like like the, the teammates like him. Joe Burrow loves him. Like they're going to keep him on the field. There's no way they're going to trust dudes like Trayvon Williams to go in there and block for uh, Joe Burrow on third downs. There's no way they're going to have Chase Brown go in there and block for him on third downs. Like, that's going to be Mixon's role, most likely. If Samaj P. Ryan's out there, then, yeah. Like, you look at guys like Jacobs and, like, guys like Ezekiel Elliott, who are not known pass catchers, but they're just in a role where they kind of back into 70 targets. Like, that could definitely be the case for Mixon. So he's going, like, way too low right now. Every day that passes by makes Mixon less and less risky in in, yeah. in my books, you know? Because nothing's happening there. When nothing's happening, that's that's a dub for, for Mixon. For sure. No, completely. I think the next guy for me that I, I cannot subject. Well, just, just to give a little periphery, I think a lot of people like like to hate on this player because of like the team and the, the quarterback situation is downgraded slightly. But if I said that you could draft a second year wide receiver that as a rookie had a forty percent air yard share, was the number one player in the NFL in fantasy points per snap versus man coverage and was twelfth in yards per route run, you'd say I want to draft that player all day. But that player is Christian Watson. And I think where you can get him at the, he's the last pick in the fifth round right now. He's round pick 60 overall. And you can get that kind of upside where you're getting the guy that was number one fantasy points per snap versus man. He is still the only player that, that Green Bay really has that they're going to be throwing to. I mean, the, his only competition for targets are Romeo Dobbs and two rookie tight ends that they drafted in the second and third round this year. Yeah. So like, I just don't see how he doesn't end up with a lot of targets, and he was one of the most efficient wide receivers in the NFL last year, and I think that he's going to continue to see somewhere around a 30 or 40% air yard share on that team. And if Jordan Love 
is like half as good of a quarterback as Aaron Rodgers will, I wouldn't be shocked if Christian Watson finishes top 20 again. Yeah, I mean, that, that's like the big question. It's, it, is Jordan Love good enough to sustain this offense, but he, he also needs to be accurate. Christian Watson, not uh, an amazing like tactician, route runner, all-around player yet. Still needs to develop. I think that's what you see from a lot of players who come out of you know Dakota and, and those kind of schools where it's like you can, when you're Christian Watson and you have elite NFL athleticism playing against those types of schools, you don't need to be like a great route runner. You don't need to develop that much. What? I think there's there's like I think the other part like you said is like you don't need to develop that much, but I think people forget that he's like the second most athletic wide receiver of all time. Yeah. A lot of people aren't familiar with like um with Ken Ken Palm and sorry not Ken Palm excuse me but I was like, about it's, to say, it's I'm the, not familiar. It's the with relative Ken Palm. A, relative athletic score by Kent Lee, and he is oh, the like second Ras? yeah the RAS score. So he's the second most athletic receiver ever charted over the last 35 years. There's over 2,000 wide receivers in the database. He has the second highest athletic score. Do you know who's number one? Calvin Johnson. I was going to guess. That, that's it. It's literally Calvin Johnson. And the number two in this entire database since 1987 is Christian Watson. Yeah. It's, it's, so we need Jordan Love to be accurate down the field, I think. But yeah. I also, I I agree, though. Like, Watson's in a prime spot to, like, we could throw a lot of names out. But they might, we might look back in a year from now and be like, all those names that we were saying he had target competition from are empty names. You know, Luke Musgrave and Jane Reed and Romeo Dobbs and, and, and Tucker And none Kraft. of them play the same role that Watson does. Like, if Correct. Jane Reed turns out to be a good, like, over the middle, like, you know, safety blanket type player. I don't think that affects Watson really. Like that just makes the offense better. Yeah, I agree. Like he he's he can be a role player, but that role can be incredibly like fruitful for fantasy. And this was a stat I think he played six games over seventy percent of the snaps last year. So it's a decent sample size. And in those six games, he averaged over eighteen fantasy points per game. And he scored eight touchdowns, but he averaged, if you take all eight touchdowns away from that, he still averaged over 11 half PPR fantasy points per game, which is a really high number for a rookie. Like, that's what yeah. Garrett Wilson basically averaged last year. So you look at Watson, you're like, oh, he's scoring like two, three touchdowns a game. But even if you take those out, he was still so highly productive and so highly used in that offense. There's no way. He also had like everything working against him. He missed like almost all of summer last year. Like when you come into the year late and injured as a rookie, typically those guys, those guys flop at like an 80% rate. If you miss the summer, if you miss the first few weeks of the season, he came in there and just exploded immediately. So now he's got the full summer. He's got to, you know, he gets to work with Jordan Love. So I'm, I'm cautiously really excited about Christian Watson this year. If he's going at the end of the fifth round, he's definitely a target of mine too. Yeah, I think there's one of two outcomes for him where he's either the guy that, why did we not all see Christian Watson? Watson coming or like why did we fall in love with Christian Watson I don't think there's any in between where people are like oh it was okay it's either like we should have known or like we should have known one yeah. way or the other. <laughs> there's only two options they're the same fucking option just for for better <laughs> or worse and I, I feel like that's probably gonna be the case with my guy in the sixth round I have Cam Akers who is the 604 right now he's another dude similar to Mixon feels like a discount Mixon where every day that passes by where we don't hear news out of that camp kind of a good thing for Akers uh is there a chance that they sign? Here, here's the reason I'm kind of excited about Akers right now, and I don't think they signed a veteran running back is because if you're a veteran running back like Zeke or you know Kareem Hunt or Fournette, at that point in your career, you're trying to go to contenders, right? And the Rams are Not. far from that. And their best case scenario is Stafford stays healthy, Cup stays healthy. Their defense is atrocious right now. Like they're maybe vying for a wild card spot. Right? Like they're not, you know, they're not going back to the Super Bowl, nothing like that. But Cam Akers, last four weeks of last season is what we're going to project into this year. Is what people are going to be optimistic about. He averaged 100 yards uh, from scrimmage per game over the last four weeks, and they gave him workhorse touches. The only thing they added on was Zach Evans this offseason. Zach Evans will probably end up being like the backup there because they got like Kyron Williams. They got uh, Ronnie Rivers, I think. Yeah. yeah, some shit like that. So it's almost like default. He has to be the guy there. Even if he's not good, I expect him to get 17 touches a game. He's athletic. He's involved in the passing game. They don't have much else going on there in the offense besides Cooper Cup. So uh, Cam Akers is the dude who I feel like we could look back on at the end of this year and be like, he was a three-down workhorse that we got in the sixth, seventh round. That's yeah. kind of the way I'm feeling about like him. Like a David Montgomery type yes. guy who's like bad offense, but plays a lot. Plays a ton, yeah. And I'm looking for touches at that point in the draft because it's the other guys. It's like Akers and then, you know, Pacheco's around there. DeAndre Swift's around there. I think those guys are a little bit more riskier. Pacheco lacks the upside because he's not the pass catching down back at all. But if Akers takes a three down roll, which again, I, there's a, who's on the depth chart that's going to take any sort of touch count away from, from Akers? Yeah, I mean, I think they'll sprinkle Evans in. Yeah, Kyron Williams could play on third downs, but I don't think any of those, 
you know, those guys are going to be like dedicated, like third down specialists. Like Akers can do that also. Like yeah. they don't really have to take him off the field. Yeah. And Akers is now further removed from the Achilles tear, obviously. It was weird because like there was at one point last season where we didn't even know if Akers was going to be like in the NFL anymore. Remember, they was like getting benched, like, ah, we yeah. don't, I don't know if we want him on our team anymore. And then all of a sudden, he's a workhorse. So I'm a, a, another player I'm very cautiously optimistic about at this point if he starts going into like the fourth round i'm not going to be drafting him but sixth round seventh round for acres feels like um someone i want to grab for the upside every single time yeah i'm completely with that i just don't see how he doesn't end up with the touches like my only fear is they end up like they think they're still in playoff contention you know this is the end of like the matthew stafford era and they sign like leonard fournette or something but yeah as long as they don't sign like a veteran running back like I think that a lot of people like to make the argument, okay, well, you know, it was only a small sample size, but they just didn't add anybody. That's and it. And like the the peripherals just say that like if they were if they really needed someone, they could have added someone. Like like I said, Leonard Fournette's out there. These other guys that are could that could be out there, and they haven't signed anyone. Like they really seem to believe in Cam Akers is still going to be just twenty four years old this year. That's the thing. Like he's still so young. He was a yeah. great prospect, and like I'm not in love with him as a player, but it's it's just the role for me. It's like simple end of story right there. Well, it, and at the end of the year, like, he finally played well. Like, the efficiency numbers were good on top of the volume. It mm-hmm. wasn't just that, like, they didn't have anybody, so they just fed him and he, like, fell into 100 yards a game. Like, he was good on a per-carry basis there at the end of the season for, like, the first time in his career. Like, put it together for, like, multiple weeks at a time. If he's that guy, like, he could be 1,000-yard rusher. Yeah, and this could, I mean, this probably, I don't know, you could you can kind of argue either way. Their line is probably going to be pretty bad. But last year, he was efficient despite, uh, I think he ranked, he ranked either... S- I think he ranks second amongst running backs in uh, yards before yards before contact. Mm. So like the line was so bad, it, like in, in in a in a negative way. Like he was right. contacted oh, immediately past his line, and I think only um, it was actually Kareem Hunt. I think ranked one. Cam Akers was two. So their line putrid. He was able to produce despite that. Their line is not really upgraded, so it's hard to be like that's a positive. But we've seen him be good despite that. I think the line narratives are something to take advantage of in fantasy drafts. Cause I think all time it's like 95% of players to ever hit like 330 touches finished like top eight. Like there's like one player to ever like have that many touches did not finish in the top eight. So if he gets like that same like 20 touch per game workload that he was seeing over the last six games last year, like he is automatically off of, unless he's Frank Gore 2.0. I think Frank Gore is the only name on that list not to get there. Yeah. I mean, he, I don't think he's going to hit 330 touches, but you don't think so. No, that's that, like, that's a little under 20 touches a game. It's like just odd that. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like everything has to break, right? Like he has to play the full 16, 17 games. He has to also get 20 touches per game. There's probably something that's going to go wrong a little but bit. But that would be him finishing top eight, though, because yeah. he's going in the mid-20s right now. So if he gets, you know, 280 touches, yeah. you know, how do we not get there? Yeah. No, I'm in, I'm in regardless. Who's got seven? I do. Seventh round, I got Deshaun Watson at the 704. Ooh, okay, first Deshaun non-running Watson. back wide receiver. Let's yes, go. Yes, yes. Deshaun Watson at the 704. He, before last season, I think he averaged like 14 points per game last season. Like, he was not very good. Not even like a good real-life quarterback last year. But he hadn't played in like literally two years Before that, he finished as the QB1, QB5, QB2, and QB5, averaging between 20.7 and 24.1 fantasy points per game in every season of his career uh, on teams that finished 23rd, 27th, 20th, and 23rd in pass attempts. So, like, now he's on the Browns with Nick Chubb. Maybe they won't throw the ball a lot. He hasn't even thrown the ball a lot in his career and still been an elite fantasy quarterback, currently going as the QB9. Uh, Guys going ahead of him, Trevor Lawrence, who... You know, we expect to take a jump, but we haven't seen that ceiling from him. Uh, Joe Burrow has gone over 20 points per game just once in his career. Justin Herbert was at 16.4 last season, not even that much better than Watson was. You would take Watson over those three guys? Not necessarily. I'm just saying, like, the, the place he's going in the draft is a nice spot of, like, value and upside. Like, the guys going ahead of him, he could be more productive than them. Like, we've seen him do it before. And then the guys going behind him are, like, Kirk, Dak, Jones, Tua, Rodgers, like... I don't hate them as starting quarterbacks either, but we haven't seen the ceiling that Watson has from those guys. Like, he's just in a really nice spot where, like, he's after the elites, but in a sweet spot of the draft where he has a ceiling that nobody else has shown before. And the other guys available in the seventh round right now are, like, Christian Kirk, Tyler Lockett, uh, JSN, you know, Pat Fryermuth, Javante yeah. Williams. Like They're not going to be, like, difference makers. I right, it's like is. you're either drafting floor or you're drafting a lot of risk with somebody like Javante Williams or Alvin Kamara. I don't think Watson carries that much risk. He's probably going to be at least a competent starting quarterback in fantasy football. 
and he has the upside to be like a top five guy. Like, yeah. He's just in a nice spot of the draft for his mix of like floor and upside. He's just such a tough eval because of I w- it, like he couldn't have just played like a little bit better last <laughs> year for us to feel better about it. Like that's the thing. Like he was so good, took the year off so bad. So it's like, where does he land? I tend to probably think about it a little bit more optimistically because I think it's not it, when guys take like a long period of time off or, you know, if they're injured or something like that. I'm very pessimistic about it if if it's an injury but he wasn't injured or if they're like older right and you're like a running back who missed a bunch of time you're like 28 years old I'm like let's not chase the prime when you're very clearly past the prime but Watson's still what 27 years old right yeah and he was still running last year too like he's not he's not one of these like former running quarterbacks who like got old and isn't mobile anymore like his 17 game pace rushing stats were right there like almost 500 rushing yards that would have put him like sixth in the league last year like he's still Mobile, still creating fantasy points with his legs. Yeah. I mean, the offensive line is still really good. I think they let open it up a lot more this year and let him pass the ball. I like the rookies that they added to the team uh, with Cedric Tillman. They re-signed Njoku. Cooper was phenomenal for them last year. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, I'm all in on Sean Watson. I think that it's going to be interesting to see. And Elijah Moore. You're all in on Watson. That's fucked up. I mean, not fucked up, dude. (laughs) Have some morals. (laughs) Just in terms of, like, I mean, where he's going is tough, but I just think the upside is so high. And I think that, like you said, that, like, I think David Njoku, I think Elijah Moore is a very... Oh, more too. Forgot about person him. to have like, and I think that that trio of Injoku, Elijah Moore, and Amari Cooper could be. You know what? You know what? We we talked before on another stream about how like we were looking for like what is like this year's Seahawks mid round. I think that like no, the, the Browns, Philly, the sorry, the Philly, Philly, Philly. Excuse me, but like the this year, like the Browns wouldn't surprise me as that like underrated team that ends yeah. up being really productive and potentially league winning for for fantasy drafts my guy for the eighth round is is jordan addison i mean you can get him outside the top 90 picks right now yeah. in in drafts and i think that he is in for a lot bigger role because like yes he's taking the adam thielen role which is like not that exciting on paper but did you know that adam thielen last year ran the second most routes in the nfl Behind Justin Jefferson. Like, I that did, was I it. Saw, I saw that somewhere So, just, on, just on in Twitter. terms of, like, volume, in terms of how many routes they're on the field, like... He's getting he's, exercise. He's going to be getting... Yeah, he's going to get we some exercise. That. But last year, the Vikings had over 30 catchable targets a game, and the Bears were at less than 15. So, a 15% target share on the Vikings is actually more valuable than a 30% target share on the Bears last year. That's wild. Like, that's just how good, like, that, that being in that type of passing offense is. And even with Kirk Cousins, the Vikings have had two top 15 wide receivers in three of the last five seasons with Kirk Cousins at, at quarterback. So if he runs that many routes, they've had a history of, like, having two good wide receivers. The first-round draft capital, they see him for a reason, is that Adam Thielen replacement, he's getting that much exercise every single week. I think that he could find that way into a potential top 20 wide receiver just off volume if he can find a way to command just about 20% of the targets. Yeah, he's definitely my favorite rookie wide receiver for redraft for, like, year one because he goes into an immediate role. He's just a really fun player. He's, like, a very, like – twitchy player that I feel like fits into that offense really well. And Kirk is, you know, just an underrated fantasy quarterback. I was just doing research for like my top 15 fantasy QBs for this upcoming year. And I was trying to make a case for like Trevor Lawrence as my QB, I think seven. And I was looking at the last like six, seven weeks of the season. And I was like, yeah, Trevor Lawrence was the QB four. I think over the last seven weeks of the season, it was like Mahomes, Josh Allen, Kirk Cousins, Trevor Lawrence. So Kirk, if they let him, I mean, Cook's probably gone. They're not going to have a strong run game. I don't think... I actually don't know off the top of my head if their defense is any good, but I feel like it's not good. It was not good last year. It was not their, good, Their right? passing defense was really like atrocious last, for a good amount of last yeah, year. Yeah, like I, I could see them throwing the ball at like a 67% yep. clip and that being just like Jefferson, Addison, Hawkinson. Jefferson, Addison, Hawkinson. It's going to be yep. kind of sexy. And, and those uh, running a lot of routes, like Addison is going to be able to get open easier at this point in his career than Adam Thielen was. Like he's a yep. good route runner. Jefferson's going to be, you know, commanding a bunch of coverage. It's going to be easy for him. Yeah, I think Jefferson ranked, I mean, unsurprisingly, was doubled uh, at the highest rate last year. Would you take Jordan Addison right now over Jackson Smith and Jigba? And, like, I know that um, JSN is going higher in, in redraft leagues, but if you're getting him at the same spot, who would you be taking between JSN and Jordan Addison? For one year, I like Addison. For one year? Yeah. I think I agree. I might, I would still go JSN honestly in redraft. Yeah, in redraft leagues, like 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 in this round, like Jordan Addison's my guy. Like I know that JSN's going about two rounds higher, but I would I would take JSN personally. I don't know. I I, I like I feel like I need to see the involvement in that offense to see what his. Here is, I I just don't see a world where like Lockett and Metcalf's uh, like route percentages are not going to come down. 
So there has to be some give and take there. Do they go permanently into three wide receiver sets, 11 personnel? I don't know. I feel like they're going to ease JSN in. I could see him having a big second half, but I also just see Addison having a good entire year. You know, So I'll take I'll take him because I think you could actually like start him as a wide receiver three flex right off the rip where I'm not starting JSN in my fantasy lineups week one, week two, week three until we start like actually seeing him kind of go off a little bit. Yeah, I think it's possible that we see JSN have like a super efficient like 95 targets just with all the other options in the passing game where like Addison feels like a lock for 110, 120. Yeah. So I mean, like that—that's that's gonna be highly productive right off the rip. He's a good downfield playmaker too. Like he could he could have big splash plays that I think are more fantasy relevant. Whereas like JSN, I mean, he he's very highly productive, obviously at Ohio State, but he's not he's not like the downfield guy that we think of with Addison. I don't know. I just think he's a lot better. I think he's a better prospect than people are making him out to be right now. I mean, he's like the, there's only two teenagers to ever put up a 90 plus PFF grade in a college season. That's Jamar Chase and JSN. Yeah, I mean, like he out targeted. Chris what do you think is a reasonable Wilson. ceiling for JSN this year? This year? Yeah. I think, like, he is one, like, well, I'd be like, it's just tough, like, without injuries. Like, his his ceiling is probably a Metcalf, top Lockett, JSN all stay healthy. Statistics. They all stay healthy. Give me his line. Because Metcalf had, like, 1,050 yards last year, and I'm like, uh, that's do, th- a, do you think he has a shot at leading the team in receiving? I think he does. Really? I think he has a shot. I think that would be the ceiling that he does it. Like, I just think that he could be that good, especially just, like, playing in that slot role. Like, I think that he actually complements... DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett well because Tyler Lockett's more of the possession receiver. DK Metcalf is more of like the downfield X receiver. Playmaker, yeah. And I think that like I could see JSN being that just like like mega super slot like wide receiver that people are just not expecting him to be. Like again, like I know like it gets overlooked so much, but I mean like before Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave got drafted, they said that Jackson Smith and Jigbo was better than both of them. He out targeted them. In their last season, and look I don't, what they did last year. I don't year. buy that. I don't buy that narrative. To be honest, I think you don't, he just, buy, you don't buy that at all. I, he's not better than Garrett Wilson. I like can definitively, very confidently, just say that. If you've watched Garrett Wilson play at all, he's just he, J- Jason is not better than Garrett Wilson. Him Do you and Alave better than Alave. Uh, that I don't have a confident take on. Yeah, I think I'll need to see JSN first. I think he has the ability to be better, but I think Garrett Wilson is like a step on Diggs elite type of playmaker. I think when you have Olave and Garrett Wilson running outside and actually facing press and man coverage, and you're just running in the slot, pretty fucking easy to put up numbers if you're a good player. I, I, JSN's not better than Garrett Wilson, but JSN could still. I, I obviously he could be a really good player. I just don't see like a big ceiling because of the competition. He could be like one of the most efficient, you know, wide receivers in the NFL just based on. The fact that those guys are out there uh, running amok on the outside, but like I don't know, I feel like his ceiling is like 800 yards this year. I think his ceiling's over over a thousand. We might have, to, might have to put a bet on it. Um, I'm some, down. Some some, some yeah. kind of loser challenge on okay. on somewhere on that. We'll think about it tonight when we're a couple right. couple tails deep at uh, Mr. Purple. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, my up round nine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I didn't pick anybody because I hated everybody <laughs> in round nine, but I wanted to dip a little bit deeper into it. Like Alexander Madison was there, but he'll end up being if Cook gets cut. He'll, uh, actually, how, how how early do you think Madison is going to get picked if Cook gets uh, cut? Fifth round? I think yeah. earlier. I was thinking like third round. I think people will talk themselves into being like he's a workhorse for the for the Vikings and we've seen him be good in games. Do we think he would be? Do you think they give a shit enough about like Dwayne McBride, mm. Ty Chandler? Like they have other guys there who might be good. Um, Alexander Madison has always been like competent, but never. I mean, he's had like real... I, I feel like that's the, the well, narrative, but he's had, like, massive fucking games. Yeah, in fantasy football, for yeah. sure. Because he just gets all the work when Cook is out. But, like, yeah. on a per-touch basis, he's just kind of fine. Yeah, yeah but, like, the, that works. We've seen that work for James Conner, yeah, and we've yeah. seen that work for guys. I think that he would end up going higher than the fifth round purely off the fact that there would be enough people that are not looking at his per-touch basis, and they'll yeah. just be, like, looking at, like, they're going to be, like, statistically, Alexander Madison is the second best running back in the NFL when he I think starts. he'd be at that, like, 2-12, 3-1 turn. I think a lot of people would be grabbing him there. So, he, so he'd be going like one or two picks behind where Jalen Waddle is right now. Jalen yeah. Waddle's the two ten. I'm thinking at like oh, in season long yeah. leagues, not underdog, because obviously no, like I know. Derrick Henry's going at like yep. a three three right now in underdog. But in season long leagues, I think like when running backs get pushed up really early, and you know all those guys are in the first round. When it gets to you know the two eleven two twelve. Uh, 3-1 when you're deciding between like Devonta Smith, T. Higgins, and then people are going to be like workhorse Alexander Madison. That feels like such a trap. I, I agree. I wouldn't take him there, but I think that's he'll end up in like the 3-1 to 3-6 range. Yeah, that, that's like five years ago when dudes like Alex Collins were getting like pushed up there every yes. like every offseason, just some random dude. 
Yeah. And I think yeah. Madison has a better case, though, because we have seen Cook miss time, and we've seen yeah, Madison yeah. come in and have, like, 150 yard from scrimmage games, where we never saw that from Collins. Like, that was pure projection. But we know we know the Vikes like him, right? Because they've had him on the team for a long time. He's been, like, he's one of the few dudes where he's a true handcuff running back and has been that for, like, four years. You yeah. know, it's everyone's like, oh, he's a handcuff, he's a handcuff. Like, they drafted Madison to be Cook's handcuff and have just used it to perfection for his entire rookie contract. Like, you never really see that play out, but I'm, I'm interested to see if he gets the role. I'm not going to buy him as a workhorse. No no way i take him that early, but that's kind of where I see him uh, falling. Not going to get him in the ninth round. Uh, Jarek McKinnon was the guy I wanted to talk about here. He's not, I think he, his ADP is like the 11th, 12th round, but I'm really in on McKinnon um, for this upcoming season because we saw how good he was last year. Led the NFL in running back, receiving touchdowns with nine of them. One of the more interesting things I was, I started to look at like Pacheco and I'm like, hmm, can Pacheco have upside this year? Is he going to be like a good fantasy running back? Their roles are so clearly defined between the two of those guys. When they get in the red zone and when they get, into third down situations. This is okay. So last year on third downs, McKinnon had 21 targets last year on third downs. Isaiah Pacheco had zero targets Wow! in the 10 yard line inside the 10 yard line. McKinnon had 11 targets. Pacheco had zero. I'm like, dude, it is so <laughs> clearly defined the way they look at Pacheco versus the way. And it's crazy. Cause I remember in preseason, Pacheco had a bunch of plays in the red zone, like catching the balls and stuff. And we were like, Oh, he might be a three down workhorse never involved in, in inside the 10 yard line in the passing downs on third downs. And I'm like, that's clearly McKinnon. I have no worries about CEH. I think they completely phased yeah. him out last year. They declined his fifth year option. I think it's going to be them too. Pacheco doing all the dirty work in between the twenties and McKinnon being the pass catching back in an offense that throws the ball so often, but has no one to throw the ball to yeah. besides Kelsey. Do you know what's a perfect comparison? Not okay. This is not a perfect comparison. James White, the big year that he had well, like five years. Not ago. only that, but like, just where ADPs were going at the time, like it reminds me of like two years ago where Mike Davis and Cordell Patterson were going. Where Mike mm-hmm. Davis was expected to get like all the work that Isaiah Pacheco was, obviously in a different offense, and Cordero Patterson was like the, great the old, Atlanta the offense, old yes. pass catching running back, but then he was just like ultra efficient. And I think that's what Jarek McKinnon could end up being this year. And I could see him catching another ten touchdown passes because his role is so fucking clearly defined and what he's doing there. Yep. I don't know. I love him back there. And he finished inside the top 20 wide, inside the top 20 running backs last year, inside the top 24. Yeah. So why wouldn't he do that again? Uh, Half PPR, full PPR. I could see him catching 70 passes this year. He's kind of like a, I kind of think of him like a Samaj P. Ryan. Like he just does the little things well that NFL teams like, and he plays because of that. Like Mm -hmm. Mahomes obviously values him. He's going to get high, he's going to get high value touches and like he's done well with them in the past. Yeah. He'll have like really big spike weeks. I'm sure there will be weeks where, you know, they use Pacheco gets the 20 carries or something like that. And he'll kind of flop for you. But this part of the draft, I'm like, I, I love where he's going. And I think he'll have weeks where it's like your 10th round pick is putting up 20 fantasy points for you. That's, that's league winning type stuff right there. Yeah, he's the kind of guy that's going to win someone a million or $2 million in like an underdog draft. He did sure. last year. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Like everyone that was grabbing McKinnon, absolutely fucking eight. Uh, we got another round. Yeah. We got the 10th round. Uh, Take us home, baby. I kind of wanted to talk about Anthony Richardson in this in this round because I like his his upside to just run for nine hundred yards. And is he athletic? Break? Yeah, he is. Okay, wasn't, o- the, wasn't sure. The only quarterback ever uh, with a higher RAS score is Calvin Johnson. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 guy that I'm going to talk about because I want to talk about him is Rashad Penny, who's going at the ten oh one. Miles Sanders last season scored more PPR points per game from rushing alone. Like if you ignore all of his receptions. There's only like 20 of them. But if, I was about to say, you know, there's not much. Right. There. But just look at his rushing. He averaged more points per game than David Montgomery, Antonio Gibson, Javante Williams, J.K. Dobbins, and Tyler Algier did like combined just from rushing. Uh, Penny's not going to get 259 carries and he has to stay healthy. We don't know if he's going to stay healthy, but he's a better runner than Miles Sanders is. And we know that a guy who just does that in this offense can be super productive. It wouldn't shock me if he ran for like a thousand yards. And this is such a nice situation for him. When he was in Seattle, they ran 72, like 72% of his carries in Seattle came on zone runs where he averaged 0.48 yards per carry than the other guys in the team on those runs. That's, that's pretty good. On gap runs that were like a quarter of his carries, he averaged 3.27 yards per carry greater than the other guys in the team. 7.8 raw yards per carry on gap runs during his career in Seattle. Uh, Nick Sirianni offenses, last year they ran 55% zone. So this is going to be a big bump in gap runs for Rashad Penny behind a better offensive line with a guy like Jalen Hurts who can freeze linebackers and create running lanes on his own. Like, Rashad Penny has been one of the most efficient running backs in the NFL his entire career, no matter what 
shape the offensive line is, no matter how good Russell Wilson's been, like no matter who else is in the backfield, he's always awesome on a per-touch basis. He's in the best situation of his career now. And if he can stay healthy, big if, but if he can stay healthy, he he has a shot at running for 100 yards and a touchdown every single week. Dude, the how that backfield plays out is going to be so fascinating this year. Do you yeah. think when all is said and done, like I'm putting no context behind this, do you think Philadelphia has a fantasy, I'll say a top 15 fantasy running back? I, you don't even have to choose which one. I do think so. Yeah. I think it's either Rashad Penny stays healthy and it's him because he gets a lot of rushing work and like scores touchdowns. Or it's just, Boston Scott, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. What I was or thinking too. Penny gets hurt and DeAndre Swift just gets a ton of work. Yeah. That would, yeah, that would low-key be best-case scenario for fantasy players, yeah. I feel like. Just one of them gets hurt, the other one goes buck wild. Yeah. I just don't see both of them staying healthy. They never have. I mean, like not like DeAndre Swift is just missing like full seasons like Penny has. One of them's like, just going to pull their hamstring in yep. August, and I think we'll be good. Like, we'll <laughs> be able to figure it out early. But even if that's Penny in, like, early October, you got four weeks of probably top 12 running back production, I think. So, so Penny's going in the 10th round right now. If DeAndre Swift just magically poof, like he, you know, Thanos snap disappears, like how high would you be taking Rashad Penny in drafts if it was just him? With There's Boston still Scott? something inside of me that's like weary of Penny in Philly, right, yeah. even if Swift was like dead. Because well, the money they gave him was like nothing, and I just like, uh, I don't know. And I feel like everybody feels like that because he kills everybody every year by never staying healthy. I think even if we remove Swift from the equation, like people aren't going to go that crazy over Rashad Penny because they have so much PTSD, but... Like, where would he settle? Probably the seventh round, maybe? Yeah. I think he'd go higher if Swift got hurt. I agree. Yeah. I think he'd probably be going fifth or sixth. Fifth? A little bit, of, maybe like five or ten picks after Christian Watson. Yeah. The sixth round. Of the, yeah. What about the strategy of uh, just grabbing Swift and Penny? Because they're not that expensive. Yeah, I think both of them are fairly reasonably priced. I, I actually feel like that's not a bad strategy. Because yeah. I, uh, I think you'll be able to start both of them weekly flexes or one of them will define the fact that they're a flex like pretty early on so yeah. you'll have the flex and then obviously if one of them gets hurt like the other one's going crazy probably yeah i kind of like that because they're like seventh eighth ninth round picks and that's not expensive at all for like upside two upside running backs two uh handcuff Talented, running backs yeah. in great fucking in a great offense you know yeah i agree i don't know i like the pieces of the equation there yeah someone is someone is going to produce from that offense and people weren't seeing it like last year with miles sanders like he was going in that set round round six seven range yeah, I, I'm with you. I think one of those guys can have a really big year. It's so going to be fun. I, I love taking both of them. Hell yeah. All right. Well, uh, that was a good vid. What are we, 40 minutes in? There we go. We went through uh, nine rounds, rounds two through ten. We'll put the link for the ADP if you guys want to go check it out, depending on where your leagues draft. Uh, make sure you're following these two on Twitter. Noah and Alex, they're both doing great work by themselves outside of BDGE. But thank you guys for joining today. Make sure you hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new here. We'll be bike tomorrow the next day the day after that all that kind of shit so see you see you